The following clip is exclusive content from the university. Access over 300 videos and 26 courses with advanced metaphysics on demand. Jump in live chats with Savan and the rest of the tribe. New materials are available monthly along with guides and regimens. Subscribe today and save $25 off your first month membership. Links are in the descriptions. Subscribe to Secret Energy TV or this channel for future show notifications. Onus. I'm going to show you some stuff that we already talked about and show you how it's so relevant to what we're dealing with right now and why this has, what I'm going to speak on today, has everything to do with ascension. So the first thing here is actually, I'm going to start off, and again, my, my goal is, is to not have to go fast here, but give me one quick second. Let me turn this off. I'm going to start here. Let me get my picture in, like, right around here. Okay, and let's go, let's go, let's go ahead and get on this journey. Now, notice how when we began this process, you know, a lot of this, especially when we speak on the inner versity, semester one, semester two, we went through a lot of these things. Also, even within ambassador training, we've gone through a lot of these things. Even in eneology, we've gone through a lot of these symbols and we see these symbols, we know what these symbols mean, but I'm going to show you today how when you connect symbols together, it creates something like, a, like puzzle, symbols are puzzles. They're puzzle pieces. And when you start putting symbols together, they start creating a picture. And if you're able to do that, you can then pull back off after all those symbols are together and you see a whole picture. And if it's about occult and arcane symbolism, you'll see a picture of what we can say is the great work. All there really is, the main purpose of existence. If we think that, what is the great work? The great work means it's the main purpose of existence. So it turns out that all human beings have the same purpose. And so when they become aware of that purpose, something happens and something changes. So the symbol that I'm showing you is how this goes is this ascent process that we're talking about is metaphorically you going into your higher consciousness or what some people would say is heaven. Okay. But in every respect, you would be basically climbing a ladder. And that's why we say it's in degrees. Because if you look at a thermometer, a thermometer starts at zero and it starts raising in degrees as the temperature raises. Now it's already getting pretty hot in here because we're on seven degrees. But the temperature also is akin to, and the degrees are also akin to wisdom and knowledge, like a master's degree. So the higher we get in the degrees, the higher the knowledge is going to get. Also, maybe the lower the count gets in the room. <laughs> Meaning like as the degrees raise, we may be sitting on, when we finally complete, it may be 40 of us in here. <laughs> I hope not, of course, you know, for accounting, but hey, it is what it is. And it's because as you get higher and higher, you, you would basically, you know, it's funny, we think we're seeing less and less, but what happens is, is that, everything just becomes the same thing. So it's not like it's less. It's just everything is, all, is merging at that stage. So it, 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 it feels like everything is alone, but in fact, it's everything is together and one. And that's why, you know, as you get higher and higher, there's just less and less and less. Everything just starts coming in together. So in this respect, then, it makes sense that this particular symbol, which we're looking at right here called the caudacious, is a symbol of the ascension process, right? Can we all see that? That this has been always metaphorically talking about the serpent going up the spine or Kundalini going up the spine, consciousness raising up the spine. So everybody knows pretty much there's the definition of this symbol, or do they? <laughs> because watch this. 
So what this symbol is related to in the Old Testament before even Jesus comes along, because this also technically becomes the cross, right? Like later on, we get Jesus on the cross, and it's pretty much this same symbol. But the symbol is mentioned first within the Old Testament in a situation going on with a character called Moses. Now, all we have to do is take these characters and put them into our consciousness and see and, and, and see the whole scene unfolding and understand the scene like a parable. Don't get don't get like a play. Don't get caught up in the characters. Understand the essence and the energy of the play so that you can learn the lesson of what the writer put the play together for. So in this case, we're taking this 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 leader, if you may call Moses, and this leader's on this mission. He's got all these people with him. And these people, they're still basically programmed. They haven't really left the old ways. While the leader is trying to take them into something new. But in this process, they get themselves into quite a bit of trouble. In this part of the scripture, the people become, they go into a land and the people start getting bit by these poisonous snakes. And the people are sick, they're crying, they're hurt. And you can kind of see that in one of the depictions of the image on the right. So Moses then, now watch the metaphors here. Moses then, you know, sits down and prays to God and is like, look, God, it, it's gotten pretty bad out here right now. The people, they're being bit by snakes. What's good? God tells him, look, these people, it's still in their hearts. They got issues. And because of that, I'm causing these snakes to bite them. So Moses says, well, come on, man. You got to give me something to be able to, to heal them with. And he says, all right. I'm going to give you this Nehushtan. And this Nehushtan, if you look it up, is actually this symbol. It's a rod with a serpent going up. And God, quote unquote, tells Moses, so when somebody has this problem, when they've been bitten by these snakes, raise this up in front of them and it'll heal them. Okay, so let's take this and decrypt it really briefly. So it's clear that all of those different part, all those people that are still doing things that are displeasing to the to God basically means all the things that you still have going on within you, things that you're doing personally that are not allowing you to get into your higher state of consciousness. So what is being offered is an opportunity to ascend to your higher state of consciousness, which is to God. Right. To send to your higher state of being God. There's no external characters in this story. Moses is not an external character. The people are not external characters. God's not an external character. And the Nehushtan is not an external character. This is all going on inside. It's a map. It's explaining, hey, if you ever get lost out there. And you're ready to go back into your higher state of consciousness, this symbol right here. We'll explain to you how to do that because this symbol is also the same symbol that Hermes carries. And Hermes carries this staff, as you can see, the staff of Hermes, which is called the caduceus in modern medicine. And this staff is supposed to also fix or cure any problem. Also in alchemy, this staff is also represented of the great work which can fix any problem. That's what this power is actually about. So it should start clicking that, hmm, what they're basically saying is if you can somehow go through the ascension process, you can fix any problem. Let's keep going. So in, in a nutshell, again, if you can raise Kundalini, it will heal you. Now, we know there's dangers with raising Kundalini, though. We've already been over that because Kundalini is like unlocking the DNA chain from the past. So all of your memories from the past start becoming you become aware of because you're basically unlocking your power. But you're not going to become aware of yourself as James in Nine, from 1978 to whenever I leave a body here, you're going to be aware of yourself from it. Th the more you unlock Kundalini, Kundalini is a timeline. 
to make this very clear, the more as you go in degrees and unlock Kundalini, you're going basically further and further through time. And so the deeper you go in, your, in time, the more and the higher magnitude you would feel and see yourself as. So that's why this whole raising the Kundalini is a practice that has to be exercised with caution because sometimes people unlock certain things too fast and then they can't really harmonize with that aspect of themselves. They just don't, they go nuts. Look at the symbol. It's like this. What does this mean? They're nuts. But, but, how, but what would this mean? If, if I was looking at a commitment and we did like this, we would be talking about the energy coming up from the base of the spine over the crown and up to the, he's got this going on, right? Or she's got this going on. But now in these days, anybody who seems to accomplish that or a lot of people who seem to accomplish that seem to kind of go nuts because there's a necessity for ground because we're talking about real power. Today, what we're going to be talking about, this is real power. This can make up the, the world will be there moving in slow motion and you will be looking at it. That kind of power. The power that they keep buying all these books for and going to all these teachers for and all that stuff. This is what we're talking about right now. It's the power to perform the miracle. The miracle is only one thing. It's not many miracles. I'm going to feed the poor and I'm going to. It's one power to be the, the, the beer of all powers. To the, the element itself that changes anything into what you want it to become. So this is why, of course, what I'm going to be talking about right now has been everything you can think of to hide this from everybody except for the initiated has been attempted, has been attempted. And so you can imagine then first, and, and, and this is how that's been accomplished. So how do you hide this knowledge? The first thing is, is that what, what we're actually in right now is we're in a spectrum, okay? It's what we call the frequency cage, all right? So how the frequency cage works is, is that it's just like a radio station, when you turn on to 92.5, the beat, when you're right on that station, is clear. As you start moving away from 92.5 to 101 or to 102, that 90, 92.5, you can no longer really hear. It fades out. It gets staticky. And then as you move close to the next station, it starts getting, it starts getting clearer and clearer. And then now you can hear it as crisp. And then you start moving away from it again. That is exactly how our consciousness works. It tunes into a specific vibrational wavelength. And then it can only really oscillate in tune like a radio station has a specific band, they call it, right? Like there's one, there's one side of this, like 88.9, then you go to AM, right? So those are bands, but there's more radio stations beyond what is on your radio, right? There's the ham radio stations, right? They, those are other frequencies and bandwidths that they use. There's the gigahertz bandwidth and the petahertz. Those are your, your, uh, your Wi-Fi systems. But remember, all this is all a part of a wavelength and a frequency band, just so you understand exactly how it works. So if you just had a radio it doesn't mean you have access to all of the other frequencies and wavelengths. You need the equipment for that. And so what this is about today is that you already have the equipment, but the equipment is already being tuned into this specific wavelength. And we call that the prism, right? It's the seven colors. But that's a metaphor also for the prison because it's like you still become locked into that band and you need to be aware that there's something beyond this. And we're actually going to see symbolism in a moment that the statement is plus ultra, meaning there's something beyond, right? And this is the, basically the initiation of the alchemical degrees. So 
what we have then, you know, because we're going to still take this slow. What we have then is generally your left brain is what is responsible for giving you this wavelength that you're on, telling you what wavelength that you're in. It has your name. It has your immediate past, your history, these kind of things. So what happens then is, is that to die would basically mean you went over to what you would say is your right side of your brain and then you pass through what is, what is similar to like a gateway out of the entire wavelength. So this is why for most people, first of all, if you were just a right brain person, you would be like, like this, with drool coming down the side of your mouth. We would have a wheelchair for you. And we'd be like, don't we love him? <laughs> oh, he's so. You wouldn't be here. You would be somewhere, but you would not be here because the right brain is a gateway to the beyond. So what we created was we created a left brain because the left brain allows you to be able to be in a world. But it can also become the mechanism that actually locks you in a world. And this is what was revealed with gateway technology, hemisynchronization, et cetera, that the left brain, it does have a purpose. You can't hate on it. It has a purpose of allowing you to be solid here. But what happens is, is that, see, what makes an adept is that when we're transferring from the left brain to the right brain through the gateway, we don't feel like we're going to die. Versus most people, and we've talked about this, when you're about to go to sleep, the left brain is shutting off. And if somehow you still have the cognizant wheels running when the tonal and the nawa are changing shifts, basically you're about to go into the dream world, you feel like there's this vapor or vortex that is happening. Like you feel like you're being sucked, right? And you feel like something's going on with your breathing. And then you immediately start feeling like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, something's trying to stop my breath. Something's try, I'm trying to, they're trying to kill me. I'm dying, right? Have you, has anybody had this happen before? It's like you be in this weird moment where all of a sudden the, the energy of your body is like you can't really control your body but you're still kind of awake and then you feel this feeling for some it feels like a suction for some it feels you know it's a feeling of some sort and it's not like all right let me go into it it's more like whoa what's going on what's happening is is that remember in the right side of the brain and in the through the gateway into the other worlds there's no air there's no oxygen. There's no none of that kind of stuff. That's here. So the first thing that happens is there's no need to breathe on the astral plane. So if, you're, if your left brain is still intact, it feels the breathing stop. Now, the maid just knows that the body is going to kick in once you get in, once you go through the gateway. You don't got to worry about what's going on. You just, it become, you become so used to it, you just... And you go, you don't never be like, oh my goodness, I'm dying, I'm dying. But what most people do is they hold on with the left side of the brain while the right side of the brain still has the gate open and then they look and that's what their dream is. The dream is, it's like, um, a, it's like a phantom-like reality of like this one, meaning that you start, you got chairs, you got friends, there's cars, but it's like, it's, it's, it's ghost. It's like, it's not clear. It's not, it's not solid. <laughs> and then you got this other thing opening up that also is, is unknown almost. And this is where the dream can take some crazy turns. Like you could just watch a dream and just all sorts of wild stuff starts happening because the gateway is open and basically the doorway to this world is open and where you're standing at is kind of in between. So you're like, the hip, both of the hemispheres are activated and you're trying to stay just there rather than going. Now, if you go to the left hemisphere completely, what are you going to do? You're going to wake up. If you go completely in the right hemisphere through the gateway, 
I can't tell you what's good. I can't tell you what you're going to do then. You see what I mean? But what most people do is they stay in between naturally. They almost have trained their left brain to keep them there. And obviously oscillations in between that space create lucid dreaming and create a lot of other different states. Okay, so we just want to clarify that the consciousness and what allows us to be in these radio stations, in these bandwidths, is based on the left brain and the right brain communication. So we've established that. So now this is what happens then. So now that you know that there is a gateway out into like the space that everything that it's like if you're on this little sliver of this wavelength and there's a gateway to the whole thing where you can get onto the whole highway of all the frequencies of life, right? What would happen? It's just like I told you before. What would happen if people had access to that space? Because at minimum, what you can do in that space is anything that you want to see, anything that you want to experience, anything that you want to touch, you could take yourself to it right then and do it. The lucid dream shows you that, right? The lucid dream is, it's not just the dream and you're seeing both sides of the world. The world, now you're actually controlling a part of it. You're controlling it. So you're more aware in the right brain and the experience going through the gateway and you start being able to call up things like whatever you want. You can fly. You can do all these different things. And this is not something that, we, this, we haven't got into throwing lightning from the hands or anything yet. We're just talking about stuff that people can do. If you put yourself and your intentions into it, you, you could lucid dream too. Now, this is very basic. Lucid dreaming is basic compared to what I'm about to talk about here in a moment. But we got to climb up this ladder. So you know that lucid dreaming is possible. So what would happen if everybody could lucid dream? Would all your desires really be in this left brain reality? Would you be so attached to this? Would you be tripping all the time, wanting somebody to do something for you? Looking for, I mean, it, it's almost like you would, maybe you wouldn't even spend almost no time here. If you didn't have any real obligations, like if you didn't have like, let's say a family or children, or the best thing probably would happen is when you got here, you would, feel so exuberant because you got everything over there. So this would just become creative in its own right. Like I got a physical body. I even got a kid over there, <laughs> you know, and they, I come there and they say, Hey, I got, so it would be, it would be a totally different experience if you had access to something that is yours already. It would change not only this reality, but it, it would change all the realities. And this is exactly why it's kept so secret. OK, it's kept so secret that basically there's been a suppression of ascension knowledge. Like it's heavy, it's deep. Watch this. I'm going to use one term. Let me see real quick. Actually, let me just keep going. Let me keep going. I'm going to get to this in a minute. It's basically that now, anytime you type in any kind of real occult terms, you get Marvel comic characters on, on the internet coming back to you. You get Pokemon cards or Dungeons and Dragons characters, Right? So you go type in some holy stuff like, I don't know, we could just start off with something like the, the Nagas. And you're not going to get an original entry about what the Nagas are. You're going to get the Naga card from the Battle Beast deck. <laughs> and then you're going to get the Naga from the, uh, the, the Cobra and G.I. Joe series. And then you're going to get, so you're going to get a whole page of not anything to do with what ain't the ancient Naga are really about. And if you really know occultism and you try to search the internet for occult words, it happens everywhere. It's, it's happening to such a level that if this continues and there is no, what you would say is occult revival, the knowledge will be completely lost. Because all of the words that are associated with the knowledge have already been re-engineered 
to be something fanciful and make believe. And then also generally the character that you're seeing is being restylized almost to opposite of what it originally existed as. We talked about that with, with um, this new character called Lucifer, which was originally Venus. And we know Venus is Aphrodite. We know Aphrodite, they got old statues of Venus and Aphrodite as a very, uh, uh, <laughs> she's got big boobs <laughs> and a large, she's got a big ass, right? And she's got, she's, can, she's looking like she can have a lot of children, okay? Na yeah, thank you, voluptuous. <laughs> Where's that? What do you say? Voluminous. Voluminous. Okay, that's a new one. <laughs> so she's thick, okay? But here we are, and we're in 2021, and we have these fake occultists that think that Lucifer is a male angel falling from heaven now. So how does that happen? Like, you can follow this even in an encyclopedia. You don't need a holy book. You watch Basically, the, the, the mistress of heaven, the pentagram and many secrets, the knowledge of Shukra, be accredited now to some, now he's got a series on Netflix. <laughs> you see what I mean? And, and, and when people talk, when they think that they understand about occultism, they say, well, Lucifer and then Satan, and then they just, <laughs> and this comes off as, oh, oh, yeah, he knows what he's talking about or she knows what they're talking about, but you can't. You don't know the symbols and the mysteries and what they're really about. And this is a product of what's happening in this reality. So I'll say this. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want anybody to be naive about what's going on here. I would love to believe that the knowledge and the mysteries are going to restore themselves soon. But at this point, we're going in the opposite direction as far as a whole in this society because we're now taking ancient things and relating them to something else and not revealing the mystery behind that. I like to call that now the double cross because the people who have this knowledge were actually people that were trusted or entrusted with this knowledge and they traded on the beings that actually gave them this knowledge and they even used the symbol of, of the double cross to kind of like speak that, speak that, like say, yeah, we, we double crossed you. We won't even let your own children know what your importance was in existence and what power they have. Okay, so let's keep going here. The suppression of knowledge, though, is not new. No telling how long it's been before, since many beings have actually seen or felt or experienced themselves truly. We know for sure that during the Dark Ages, that there was basically a 4 to 6% literacy rate. So this means that in most cases, especially in, in Europe, the kings and the queens couldn't even read. This is, needs to be very clear that the literacy rate, you can go look it up anywhere, the literacy rate was very low in Europe. To a point where right now in the United States, our literacy rate is 99%. You got to sit back for a moment and, and, and realize these numbers. Right now, our literacy is, literacy is at 99%. And still foolishness going on, I mean. But we're at 99%. So imagine what it was like to be at 4 to 6% and what was going on. If you think that some of the stuff you see going on around you right now is kind of senseless and mindless, imagine at four to six percent what's going on around you. So then we also know that in these domains, in these territories, in these fiefdoms, they killed anybody that was coming with knowledge. Socrates was offed because he had knowledge. There was another cat that was trying to give him the, the stars and how the stars was mapped out. And because that didn't map, match with what the king was saying, they killed him too. This was happening all the time. You can go and get at least that. The dead philosophers. 
And this is all happening, let's say, in the area where most of the occultism is coming from now. Like, meaning that the people who are producing the occult knowledge and writing the, all the books now were the last people to really even reach literacy. And that was for a reason, because there, were group, there was basically one group that had all of the knowledge. And their goal, or one of their goals, was to destroy all of the knowledge in the world. This is why you burn all books. People are not looking at it. It's not just because they liked Christianity so much. They weren't even real Christians to the truth extent of what, Christ, what, a, what a, a, a Christian is or what a, a, a person who practices the Christ, the, uh, the Christ or the past of the Christ or the, what they call the initiations of uh, the Venusian, the initiations of the Venusian, right? That's the, the, the rites of Christ, right? So they, they didn't care anything about that. It was about destroying all of the knowledge. So that way, the only thing that was ever written about the truth would be what they wrote about it. So the reason why this is possible is because what this truth that I'm going to talk to you about today imparts on one who knows it is indeed what you could call everlasting life. Ability to not die, to not suffer death, as most people understand death. This is why that same symbol that I showed you earlier, the Nehushtan, became the cross that Jesus was on. And Jesus' main miracle was what? Raising himself from the dead, right? But he wasn't the first one to do it. I'm going to show you that, in fact, to do that put you into a specific cult. In this case, it we're going to talk about the cult of Her, which is Hermes. Hermes is not one person. Hermes is an entire cult. Pythagoras was a member of the Hermetic Brotherhood. Hermes or the Hermetic Brotherhood is a mention of an entire body of those who know how to perform the rites of Herm, which are taken from the alchemical rites. What are they? How to basically die and then come back to life. Like that's the maximum. There, there's a lot of other things you can do with it. But the greatest thing that you can do with it is to, to bring yourself back to life after you die in the world. So let me show you this. So ironically, this literacy issue within uh, Europe was caused because there was no paper, ironically. So just to be very clear, the lack of having paper is really also because paper is like arguably the most advanced technology that has ever been had on the planet. Believe it or not, by the end of this build today, you're going to see that paper is way more powerful than anybody has ever thought that it was. They're ignoring it. But because, as we know, paper is generally created from trees, it's 160,000 trees a year minimum is how, much, uh, how many trees have to be taken down from the amount of paper being used just in small countries. But that paper in those trees, it has some power to it and this power had not necessarily bestowed itself upon a certain group of people. So they were writing on stones. So if you had any knowledge from somewhere else, it was generally on something very heavy like metal. Like you come up with the emerald tablets, like big old slabs of, like look over in Kim, it's like big old slabs of stone with just a story written out. Because, you know, until papyrus is coming along, this is a, pro this is a slow process. So also languages were just constructed of symbols, not really entire words and letters. And we ain't finna write all that. <laughs> let me just hit you with one symbol and, and that's how we're communicating. So let me keep going here because we're going to come back to that. So just remember that the main cause of illiteracy was actually the lack of paper within many of these territories. Why it's clear that in some of the territories they had already discovered paper, like in the ancient Orient, they had discovered paper and also money a little bit earlier than everybody else. 
So here's what happens, though. I wanted to bring this up about the illiteracy rate just to get you into the frequency of realizing that, okay, well, if there already came a time where our mothers, our fathers, our uncles, our great aunt, grand uncles, great grandmother, whatever, had all of their information basically erased, how would we come back into the knowledge? This is just something that we have to ask ourselves. It's critical thinking. We would think the knowledge would just arrive again. Do you think the knowledge just arrived again? Or do you think that the knowledge that we have is the knowledge that these same people that were the perpetrators of this put in front of us? I just have to make sure that this is very clear. If we already know that the world got to a point, especially after slavery and all this, where literacy rates went to an all-time low, secrets were hidden, how would we come back into the original knowledge if it was hidden from us? Now, some will say, say in the DNA, we had to even be aware of the DNA. We've just spent like the four or five, last four or five years, 10 years now unfolding DNA, especially in the spiritual community, talking about DNA. The thing is, there's, there's many different sources we can get this knowledge from, right? So somebody else is saying dreams. Somebody is saying DNA. There could be intuition, right? But what that seems to do sometimes is just give you fragments. I can testify to that. It's like you just get these pieces and you're like, I just don't know what the rest of this is connected to because we're even in a whole different state right now. Like we're in a whole different environment, a whole different frequency our world looks nothing like the original world. So when we're shown things from the original world inside of, let's say, the dream within a dream, we may not even be recognizing what we're seeing and what it's saying. So our ancestors bestowed techniques, knowledge, wisdom, awareness, and abilities in the event that something like this happened. And what we're taught to do is it just so happens with something very powerful that when someone comes into possession of it, even if they want to hide it from everybody else, especially things of this nature, they try to use it in something else. Right? It's like they try to bring this powerful thing under the guise of something that they created and then they bring it to everybody and then everybody thinks, wow, they're, they're wow, they created all this. So what do we have in society right now that is at the magnitude of being able to perform the great miracle, which is like akin to the alchemical trees of turning dirt into gold? What do we have around us that can even fit that bill? Money. Money. <laughs> 